suggestion. Um, we also want to make sure missing data wasn't the cause of our results. There's a lot of mission, missing data in this data set. Um, and so we varied our rules for data exclusion, and we found that there were variations in magnitude, but not in the interpretation of our results for the most part. Um, and we also ran regressions where we controlled for the amount of data that had been imputed in each data point, and we still found that there was a significant post-lockdown effect. So changes in how reliable the sensors are don't seem to be what's causing our, um, our results. There's a lot of heterogeneity in these sensors, so there's more research is definitely needed to determine where you know, where the effect is large or small or even opposite the average. Um, so a bit more than half of sensors are showing less peaky. Uh, about a third of sensors are showing, uh, actually observing more peakiness in the post-pandemic period. Um, and there's a geographic pattern to that. So in Sacramento and the Bay Area and Orange County, you see a significantly decreased peakiness of occupancy. But in Los Angeles, for example, you don't actually see a significant change. And the flow numbers are harder to interpret because, for example, in the Bay Area, you actually saw an increased peakiness of flow, probably because that area was you know, very congested to begin with, whereas in Orange County, you see decreased peakiness of both flow and occupancy, probably because that is, doesn't contain the central city in Los Angeles and just where the sensors are placed. We did find the central coast, which is more rural, and then the Inland Empire, which is an urban area, but has you know, a somewhat different mix of industries than the rest of California, actually showed increases in peakiness as measured by occupancy. And we don't really have a good explanation for that. So I'm happy to hear any suggestions on what you think might be special about those regions. Um, in terms of policy implications, um, rush hour is spreading out in a lot of areas. This is likely to continue long-term because of telecommuting, which survey research indicates is also likely to continue long term. Um, lowered rush hour travel demand might reduce the need for um, infrastructure investments, even if the overall travel volumes stay the same. But we still need to do research to understand the heterogeneity. Um, auto infrastructure causes all kinds of problems with pollution, disruption of neighborhoods and urban sprawl. We all know that we can kind of skip over that in the interest of time. And then just in summary, even as traffic returns, on average, anyways, rush hours are spreading out, um, though there's heterogeneity. And when we're considering changes to the infrastructure or doing long range planning, we should consider how changes to the temporal distribution of trips might affect those plans. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you very much for a great presentation. So, uh, does anyone have any question? Yes. I have a first a question. Uh, I mean, I'm interested just in the total volume. So did the total volume, uh, the integral of the flow over time change over the pandemic or not? Or did it remain approximately the same? It's, in, it's, in the... So it's on average, it's pretty close. It's down about 3% at the average sensor. That There's a distribution to that, um, of course, with some sensors where it's down quite a lot and some sensors where it's actually increased quite a bit. So like for the example here, I tried to pick I picked one where it had actually increased a little bit to and but was still pretty close to try to avoid mm -hmm. you know effects from that. But I, I don't think that's what's causing the, the results. And are the sensors that you use, the PEMS uh, sensors, the loop detectors, the inductive loop detectors? Sorry, sorry, the PEMS data source? Uh yes. Which uh, source did you use? Did you use the yeah. PEMS data source? We used PEMS, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. Because uh, did you find any issues associated with uh, data quality? Because there are some situations, for example, where some sensors can uh, can saturate or can give uh, can can give the values of occupancy that are out of bounds. Or yeah, so we we did impose some data filtering rules about the values of occupancy that were out of out of bounds. Um, the PEMS mm -hmm. data is also pre-filtered, and they've imputed a lot of information. Okay, um, with imputation techniques that I think are largely reasonable. So we did some, some data cleaning and we did some robustness checks where we varied our data cleaning processes. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, data quality is, is a problem. Because uh, one, of, one of the big factor I believe uh, that could be potentially a problem is also the fact that at very low occupancy, if I'm not mistaken, the PEMS data reports occupancy in percent. So when you have very low values, you have a huge uh, uncertainty. I mean, you have a huge relative uncertainty associated with these measurements. For example, if you report uh, 0 
occupancy that can be anywhere from 0 0.09 to 0 0.11. And that's always difficult uh, to, to process because of this, uh, of this, uh, some of this uh, quantification, basically. This quantification. I mean, I think it, it reports it in percents of five minute increments. So it's, okay. so it's in a couple seconds, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, it can be. Uh, I mean, it's it's always the the projection into that uh, that scale of a percent that can be at, at very low volumes that uh, lead, for example, to difficulty in estimating speeds, for example, using the formula. Yeah, I mean, so my my expectation with that would be that, it, as you say, at very very low volumes where you're talking about zero versus one, mm -hmm. um, maybe not so much. But at the volumes for the road segments that are actually interesting, where we're concerned about congestion. Um, I would expect that that's you know the whether you're rounding down or rounding up is going to be pretty much a random variable. Very good. Yeah, thanks. These are very interesting results for the for the time. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it shows that the network is more efficient. So, <laughs> yeah, very good. Thank you very much again, Matt, for the presentation. Uh, does anyone have any other question before we move on to the next? presenter all right so if no other question let's move on to the next presenter who is going to be a uh, dr zoo um, that will present a review on the volume delay functions connecting theoretical fundamental practical deployments and emerging applications okay thank you christine let me share my screen can someone give me the right uh wait a minute dr joe i need you Okay, here we go. Okay, you're good to go. Okay, so I have about 15 minutes to go. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I will go uh, very quickly about a long review um, on volume delay function. People may say, hey, you are too old. You are review volume delay function. You are review this emerging technology. So I try to just uh, really show my, my, my recent journey, uh, particularly by working with uh, uh, Pan, uh, uh, Dr. Guo, Dr. Chen from Beijing, you know, doing my sabbatical leave at Beijing, and the Dr. Liz and Mohammed uh, from ASU uh, in this state. So we try to present our perspective on why volume delay function is still very important, particularly in connecting uh, theoretical foundation, uh, practical deployment, and emerging technologies. Uh, so I will start with the introduction motivation. I try to show you the uh, different ranking of uh, ju related journal paper. And then we try to highlight the volume delay function have a very deep connection with uh, microscopic traffic flow, fundamental diagram, curing model. And uh, when you try to go to the different you know, uh, uh, emerging technology evaluation, you have to look at uh, many uh, important detail. So the volume delay function has been widely used in static traffic assignments. I don't need to go into all the detail parameters such as the free flow speed, free flow travel time, capacity, but I want to show the my perspective to you is that uh, uh, those parameters are directly connect to the fundamental diagram and has a lot of uh, complexity when you try to apply the model along the way. The, the different volume delay function, the earliest one is a Chicago area transportation study in 1963. And uh, why did it use BPR function has at least a, a polynomial functional form. Uh, HCN has been really promoting different functional forms for the different facility types, different area type along the way. So as you know, my, my research background is dynamic travel assignment. So uh, early days, we try to criticize the BPR function with some certain limitations, such as uh, it does not capture the Q evolution. It does not capture the uh, Q spillback or the uh, over congestion condition. So we always show BPR function has some certain limitation. Uh, we uh, encourage the use of side transmission model of the uh, based on the triangular uh, relationship. And uh, over the years, we see the difficulty in DTA, particularly simulation-based DTA, has a difficulty in capture the Q evolution when you realistically, uh, when you incorporate Q evolution in your uh, simulation-based system, everything becomes uncontrolled. Uh, 
So let's just going back to the static traffic assignment. They had this volume over capacity ratio. Do we mean V as volume or congested demand? By C, do we mean this as capacity or Q discharge rate? There are many things for us to uh, take a, a, a deep uh, look. Uh, uh, there's also the similar discussion in the TMIP, one of the largest uh, online forum in uh, planning. Uh, people are talking about static traffic assignment versus dynamic traffic assignment. Uh, we do see that a limitation on dynamic traffic assignment in recognizing those uh, uh, large scale in the application. And, but uh, the static traffic assignment could not replicate the Q propagation very well. There's a many conversation on, on that. Some argument is that uh, the static traffic assignment could not capture the overcapacity area. So we have to use dynamic traffic assignment. And uh, some uh, planners just uh, try to uh, uh, provide the old saying, all models are wrong, you know, please don't argue with each other. So this motivates me to have a deep look on static traffic assignment uh, with the volume delay function. Okay. So let me just skip you know, all this uh, uh, discussion. Uh, one planner have this argument, as long as the static traffic assignment model uh, can satisfy the FIFO condition, such as a Q principle, as long as a static travel assignment can capture the congestion duration, can capture these uh, uh, the time dependent Q length, it could be a good uh, analytical travel time function. Uh, you do not need a uh, full scale of simulation based DTA. Uh, so our perspective here is we need to understand the difference between bottleneck discharge rate and the highway capacity. We need, we need to understand the recent uh, progress on the Q evolution and uh, how we can use a Q-oriented travel time to derive different performance uh, function. And also, uh, at the end of the day, no matter is a standard travel assignment or dynamic travel assignment, as soon as we can reasonably represent the Q building up propagation, as long as we can numerically uh, calculate those uh, what is stable gradient uh, from the uh, travel time function, uh, this is still a good uh, selection for us to moving forward. It's not just about simulation versus analytical, it's more about how we can serve the practitioner's needs for the large scale travel assignment. So let me just go over the history of uh, volume delay function very quickly. And uh, I try to just uh, do these a few more steps for you to see how the practitioners are working on the volume delay function uh, calibration. They will calibrate the capacity first. They will look at the congestion bottleneck characteristics, particularly on the congestion duration. Number three, they will try to select a particular functional form. Number four, they will embed their own volume delay function in a static travel assignment and then to evaluate the different policy. Number five, they will look at the MOE, which is more than just travel time. They will look at the queue. They will look at the congestion duration for this uh, short-term or long-term planning task. So I have been seeing a, a number of papers related to uh, the modeling of the CAV, mobility and service, public chances. I just highlight the different points related to volume delay function. Uh, uh, I try to show that the volume delay function has been widely used in the uh, research area you know, to evaluate the uh, performance uh, in the regional setting. And if you go into the related discussion, for example, you evaluate the volume delay function uh, for CAV, then you can still link the kinematic wave back to the capacity. If you model the mobility as a service uh, using volume delay function, then the point to point travel time is very important. If you use public transportation as your application case, then how to generate a time dependent travel time using volume delay function is important. So we look at the uh, related volume delay function, uh, uh, either application or the theoretical development, uh, TRB basically is a transportation research record, and then followed by the part B, then followed by part A are the major outlet 
uh, for the publication. We can see if I use the volume delay function as a keyword, many new to topics or old topics will cluster from the travel time, traffic congestion, traffic control, queue analysis. So uh, volume delay function should be placed in a, a very important research topic in, in our area. I try to just uh, uh, have a Google Scholar based search. You may see the volume delay function original paper has been cited by uh, 200 times, but there's a, about 3,000 times of the citation simply just mention BPR without having the original reference back to the US Bureau of Public Roads in 1994 mm -hmm. uh, research reports. Then on the other hand, you may see Webster, you may see you know, uh, link capacity function review from part B and a number of important classical papers along this line. Then if you go back to the original papers, uh, uh, the US uh, Bureau of Public Road 1964, there's also you know, some paper recognize its importance. Then uh, you can see the number one here is the selfish routing in the capacitative network and uh, the MSA uh, calculation you know, is, is important you know, for you to note it. Okay. So let me just go for, forward about our recent perspective on volume delay function. Okay. Many functional forms, but it's important for you to understand those D over C should be uh, carefully defined more than just volume over capacity. Uh, uh, we also need to look at the different way for this D over C calculation. Uh, D can be defined in demand at the capacity, can be defined as the congestion demand uh, for the congestion duration. And uh, if you look at the original paper using stochastic curing model, the D is defined as the average arrival rate under this uh, non-saturated condition, what is related to the zone uh, parameter. And the different functional form may have the different calibration results, but overall they have this increasing pattern. Okay, as you can see, we are using the real life data from PANS to show that uh, the, the deviation of the different functional forms. And then when you go to the capacity, many different ways have been proposed for the capacity, such as 85 percentile, 99 percentile, and uh, uh, a sustainable capacity. And also you need to look at how you use the different aggregation interval, such as the five minute data, 15 minute data, or 60 minute data. So we just try to show this highlight for the researchers to encourage practitioners have a more systematic way to determine their capacity to be used in the BPR function. And also the BPR function has been widely used in user equilibrium calibration with information, without information, with real-time information. Uh, the PAMAD has proposed a value different ways to calibrate the equilibration point and the stochastic non-recurrent delay. So this is another uh, important uh, notes I want to offer here. Then if you look at the whole congestion duration based on the speed and the flow, we do see the speed reduction after the congestion uh, breakdown. We do see under this uh, region, there's an effective discharge rate being reduced, uh, uh, forming a U-shape. So in this way, I want to just uh, promote a better connection from our practical model, from the uh, peak hour factor to this congestion duration. Otherwise, I see a huge gap from the practitioners all the way to our traffic flow model. So a carefully des designed peak hour factor should be linked to the different stage of these uh, uh, bottleneck characteristics. By doing so, we will be able to measure the total demand volume exceeding the capacity. And by doing so, we will be able to link link volume, inflow demand, Q and the heavy congestion condition to uh, the, the, the practitioner you know, uh, BPR function. 
And also you need to understand when people are talking about over congestion, they use some simple approximation to approximate uh, uh, the over congested regime. Uh, 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 people have to look at the original classical paper to understand the way they use this approximation. It does not mean that uh, volume delay function uh, fail to recognize V over C greater than one. It has different approximation. And the approximation can be related to the way you're assuming the polynomial arrival rate. And uh, we try to highlight it's important to use T0, T1, T2, T3 to classify beginning of the queue, ending of queue, and uh, the highest queue at the T2. And uh, the T1 is the highest arrival rate based on a classical paper from Dr. Uh, Nuo to use quadratic arrival to quantify this volume delay function. Okay, at least all this uh, table for you to, to look at this further. And uh, the fully approximation Q is a one of the important uh, connection for us to look at it. So due to the time limit, I'm not going to some further details. I want to show that there's a so much research still needed for us to understand the fluid based Q, understand how we model pedestrian, bicycle, heterogeneous traffic flow, and understand the delay function at the signalized intersection. So without a solid understanding of the theoretical foundation, uh, if someone just simply apply volume delay function to the different application, this might miss some great research opportunities and uh, uh, might not produce the best available research uh, evaluation uh, to the application. Okay, uh, not to mention the human driven vehicle versus automated vehicle. And not to mention, this is our suggest framework within multi resolution framework. You need to study the fundamental diagram, study the microscopic application, understand the consistency from car falling to fundamental diagram and then back to the volume delay function. And uh, uncertainty associated with the volume delay function is another research area. I will just only just show this for your information. Finally, calibration of volume delay function require different data sources, travel time data, volume data, capacity, discharge rate, and cutoff speed. And then uh, reliability consideration require us to look at the capacity distribution. Finally, I just uh, conclude my uh, uh, presentation today on this. Uh, uh, why we need only delay function to quantify multimodal transportation. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this quick presentation, Gresham. So um, does anyone have any question on these uh, volume delay functions? We'll discuss further. So I guess you mentioned some very interesting points about uh, the, the functional relationship uh, in some specific uh, new uh, domains, like for example, uh, AVs, uh, et cetera, um, mm -hmm. uh, how, or interaction maybe between different types or, or um, non-homogeneous flows. Uh, so what do you think is the most uh, critical uh, research that needs to be done in the, in the future years to is it on the prime of calibration, on the prime of determining the functional relationship to, to use or? Yeah, Christian, you have a very important question here is uh, because we have two sides of the uh, management. One is the demand side. We are managing the arrival rate in terms of if I use a polynomial arrival rate, will be the highest point and the curvature of the pickness, the degree of the pickness. Another side of the supply side philosophy, try to improve the discharge rate meal as much as possible with a, without uh, congestion um, um, uh, propagation. So how we can integrate these are two things to understand the price of demand side strategy, price of the supply strategy, and uh, there's a certain analytical functional forms are already available. So we need to look at this theoretical uh, investigation closely. Otherwise I see too much simulation uh, based uh, evaluation, you know, we, we need some theoretical insights along this way. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, any other question to Crescent or? Right, so if no other question, just in the interest of time, we're going to move on to our next speaker. So thanks again for this great presentation. Uh, yeah. Our next speaker will be, um, so it will be uh, Swastik Kala. 
uh, who will present uh, some work on developing novel performance measures for traffic congestion management and operational planning based on connected vehicle data. So, uh, Swastik, the, the floor is yours. <coughs> You can share your screen. Uh, can you right. see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen now. Thanks. Yeah, okay. uh, hello, everyone. This is Swastik Kartka, and I'm a PhD student uh, in transportation engineering from Uni University of Texas, Arlington. Today, I'm going to present uh, our already published paper uh, termed as Developing a uh, novel performance measure for traffic congestion management and operational planning based on connected vehicle data. And my co-authors are uh, Dr. Taylor Lee and Chichao Wang. The paper was published in university, uh, it, it was published in Journal of Urban Transportation and Planning, ASCI journal. Uh, Let's let first let's talk about uh, what's ICV or not uh, because even the topic says connected vehicle data. So let's talk about what is ICV. Uh, is ICV is basically internet connected vehicle, or that means connected vehicle data. Uh, internet connected vehicle uh, is basically a, a passively crowdsourced and it's collected by an automobile manufacturer company. One of the company that we 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 dealt with while doing this experiment uh, research was the GMC General Motors. And why ICV is because I compared to any traditional vehicles, uh, GPS data set, the mm. ICV data set uh, contain high fidelity waypoints and uh, such as location, um, latitude, longitude, even headings and speeds like that. Uh, even if it contains some abnormal events like heartbreaking and seat belt, uh, seat belt uh, information, whether the seat belt is used or not. So now um, ICV data is uh, highly accurate uh, compared to any traditional data, and it holds very great, larger, greater promises in congestion management because each way a waypoint includes latitude, longitude, uh, the timestamp, speed, and headings. Uh, ICV data for the interconnected vehicle data provided for our research was a Wazer, Wazer data service. It's a third party by General Motors. And it has a penetration rate of around 10 to 15%. So that means around 10 to 15% of a vehicle uh, in the roadway of DFW, uh, Dallas Fort Worth Network, Roadway Network, act as a pro vehicle, which, 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 was, uh, which helped us for uh, doing our research methodology. So what we did first is we basically, uh, before even going to methodology, what was our aim to do this is to find out the hidden bottlenecks uh, in a freeway, especially. Uh, since there were there were a lot of hidden bottlenecks in a freeway that cannot be uh, simply found, so we were looking at uh, previously connected historical data to see whether uh, the bottleneck bottleneck existed in the in in the freeway. So the methodology was to develop a framework for processing those ICV data. Uh, in general, the, IC, the the main challenge for us was that the uh, the interconnected vehicle data or the Wazo data that we had. It is very huge. Even like a few weeks of those data is like hundreds of gigabytes of text file, because the way they process the data is they give the the, the company give us the entire um, entire uh, United, oh, central uh, entire um, United States data. So from there we we cannot process all the data since it will take uh, it will take a long time to process the data. So we need to scale down the data into the desired uh, scalable form that we need. So a scalable data processing framework framework to filter out um, mm. the irrelevant information was proposed. So as you can see on the right hand side, uh, let me see my. Just, Okay, as you can see on the right hand side, there are two figures. So basically the bigger box, this is the entire data set that has been given to us. And the yellow, uh, yellow uh, irregular box, uh, which is termed as A, uh, it's a desired location that we want to see. So how we, how we process is, is that we, we uh, use this framework to reduce the data size and screen out the irrelevant data set. We check whether the geolo geological points are within the irregular point uh, polygons at a larger scale. 
uh, we rasterize the border boundary rectangle on a GIS map. So first process was to draw these kind of boundaries, which in our case would be a boundary around the selected highway or, or freeways or even our trails. So after drawing those polygons uh, on a GIS map, we took out those uh, polygons, we took the KML files and we uh, run it through our code where we focus on waypoints that are within the boundaries of the polygon. So the uh, so the the way we represent this problem is like uh, like image pixel image uh, analogy of image pixel of of BR. So the entire reason is uh, uh, the entire reason is taken as BR uh, and all the data sets and it is uh, it is considered as a as an image pixelation where initially everything is set to all the values are for every pixel it's set to zero. And anything that falls inside those bound the rectangular uh, rectangular boundaries or the polygon boundaries is con is uh, converted into one. So now we want to take the the information that that one has and to filter out the entire data set. This way we get rid of all those extra um, uh, irrelevant information that we don't need for our research. And then the computer vision library referred to as OpenCV version 4.5.4 was uh, used to perform this task. Uh, now the second process, second step is after, since we already cut down uh, to a smaller uh, scalable data size, now we need to map, match those data sets into that real existing roadway network. Since the the, the, the ways of data or the, the interconnected vehicle data only has latitude and longitude. It doesn't have an idea of which way, which roadway section is it or where the where exactly in the roadway network those data are. So we need to map match the, um, those data sets to our, into our roadway network. And for that, we use the algorithm and the steps are given over here. So first step is to grid the roadway network. As you can see on the right hand side, the figure, this one figure, the entire green roadway network is the roadway network for Dallas for the uh, DFW. And then uh, first we need to grid them. So basically grading is like dividing the entire data sets into smaller boxes, like um, by uh, it's, let's, let's say 10 by, 10 by 10 grid. So every box. So let's say we are looking at the point that lies in the, um, in the grid X, so over here. So if the point lies in grid X, then there's no, no need to check uh, or no need to process the data for grid Y. So basically grading helps us to again uh, scale the data in, uh, into very smaller and scalable form. Then the second uh, step is to identify the list of crossing grids for a roadway network. So the problem, the problem is that our roadway networks are not small. So every roadway links are longer and they not only uh, cross small links, uh, one grid, but they keep on continuing crossing uh, various grids. For example, in this figure, figure B, from I to J, the yellow points is uh, the two yellow points is the starting and the ending of the any roadway link, and the red arrow is let's suppose suppose it's a link. So while crossing while the starting and ending point is I and J, we can see there's a red box inside where the data points cross the another grid. So in order to uh, in order to uh, fix those issues, so what we take instead of just taking those two grid, we 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 looked at identifying the list of crossing grids, which can be the whole entire I J. Grid, so it can be a rectangular grid, which includes some extra grid, like in a green color. That it helps to make sure for us that no import, like the important information, uh, we are not missing the important information. And the third uh, step is just to match the GPS waypoint. Every grid and every link or roadway network has its longitude and latitude. And for example, as you can see on this uh, figure A, there are two roadway link. And the point is somewhere in the middle. So we measure the actual distance, um, uh, the actual distance, and from of that point to the links to both the links. And whichever the dist whichever distance is the shorter one, we uh, associate those link 
uh, with those uh, waypoints. So basically those, that vehicle goes to those links or it is passing through that links. The problem with this, uh, one problem with this algorithm is that sometimes what happens is we have overheads. That means um, uh, there are two different road going over and under or, or in, in a big intersections uh, around the two different highway, major highways there are over overlays. So on, so the distance of the point, if the, if the if the vehicle is passing through the over, overhead, the distance from the, the point to the overhead or the distance from the point to the, uh, the roadway that lies under the overhead is pretty much the same because our data doesn't have any uh, the third dimension or the height information. So in order to remove those pro issues, there's another uh, points we have, which is termed as heading. Heading gives the direction uh, information to the direction. So by filtering out based on heading, we again shorten the uh, data set into, into a desired data set that we need for our uh, experiment. Uh, that, and this is this also helps that, that in order to remove the mismatching issues, heading was used. Now, um, the performance metrics, what was used was a time dependent speed, uh, a time dependent link speed, which is basically an average of the vehicle uh, speed, and then the degree of uh, speed harmonization, which is also termed as DSH. So, so what happens is, as you can see uh, in the right hand side, so vehicle one speed profile is given a green dotted line. So it says it has been accelerating constant speed, deacceleration, constant speed acceleration. So there's acceleration and deacceleration going on. For a vehicle two uh, speed profile, uh, which is black dotted line, it, it, it has a constant speed, it accelerate and goes again at a constant speed with a higher increased speed. So if we took the average, the average speed it looks like some like a, like a red bold line, and it does not account for acceleration and deacceleration that the first vehicle or the vehicle one has. So, in order to come up with those um, issue, DSH was DSH was, was introduced, where uh, where the where the larger the diamond so where the larger the dimensionless DSH value value means the the vehicle more likely more likely vehicles frequently accelerates or deaccelerates. Larger the value, the more accelerates and deaccelerates and vice versa. So case study. So using those two, uh, those uh, now after so, uh, scaling down the uh, I, the internet, the, those voyager data and map matching to the desired roadway network, uh, we know that map those voyager data have la latitude, longitude from which we can find the distance traveled. And then also it has a timestamp, which gives us uh, an idea about uh, speed, um, delay, and, and and also we can, <clears throat> so, so what we did is we looked at um, the queue, uh, uh, looked at the vehicle delay and, and if there is any queue in the freeway network. Uh, so we choose the segment on I-20 intersection, interstate highway. Uh, it is a major corridor for traveler in the city of Arlington, and the speed limit was 70 miles per hour. Six mile, six ramp along with the uh, uh, was there at that study area. Heading was used to separate the east and west bounds. And um, vehicle trip is broken into two or more if the time travel between the two consecutive waypoints is longer than two minutes. What does that What does that mean? Is, is since it has uh, six exit and six ra uh, ramps, so the vehicle can go out of the highway uh, after after a few couple of minutes, it can come back to the highway. So see if since if the if the difference on that time is only less than two minutes, it is counted as one strip. Uh, but if it is more than two minutes, longer any longer than two minutes, then the, those strips were broke, broken into separate trips. So the case study, from the first case study, a total of 36,345 vehicle strip were retrieved from June 1, 2020 to June, 2, June 7, 2020. A 24-hour space diagram was constructed. Uh, and um, what we consider is uh, since uh, 65 or 70 to 65 kilometer per hour was the speed limit, any speed lower than 40, 40 miles per hour was um, considered as a slow movement, suggesting that there is a queue, some kind of queue in the uh, in that area. 
So from the fig, we generated a few figures. And from figures, the, the red one represents the westbound and the blue one represents the eastbound. As you can see, there is no pattern. There is no like um, morning peak here and like afternoon peak. And the reason behind it was we were at the very uh, surge of um, um, uh, those COVID-19 uh, lockdown period because of that we didn't have everyone was working from home and we didn't have we didn't see a very specific uh, peak hours or morning and evening peak hours but as you can see around night time at night time we can see that there's uh, the queues are very high so in the third region which is this blue the blue um, area uh, we can see that the queue length reached to the maxim maximum between 8 to 9 p.m. from 8 to 9, and uh, and it disappears from 11, after 11.30. Uh, what, what does it suggest is that um, the ICB data for this case study were collected during the lockdown period, as, of, as I said earlier, and, and the cause for the bottleneck was road construction and the road, road work management. Figure, uh, because those, uh, those um, uh, Bottlenecks are those slow moment was due to uh, construction and especially it happened during the night time because the construction was uh, they started the construction during the late night times. So because I, I thought, I think, yeah, sorry, can you can you briefly conclude uh, because your time is uh, approximately up. So just uh, let, let's keep a case study too. Do you want to just conclude your presentation briefly? Okay, sure. And then we sure, can go yeah. to questions. Yeah. Okay, and with the same approach, we did the we did the case second study, and we find the um, uh, number of vehicle that were moving slowly over here, which is also known as the percentage of the vehicle. And from there, the 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 reason of this the case study too was to look at the arterial, not the not the freeway. And then it's, it's same thing with the case study too too. And then at the conclusion, we present. So this is our uh, like effort to uh, explore and ex explore the potential potential of ICB data. So we did first design the efficient algorithm to screen out the data set and match the vehicles we point to the match uh, to the maps. And the different two case, case studies were performed, as you can see. And then uh, and these the, the new uh, performance met metrics um, DSH also helps to assume a non-delayed travel time. And from here we can conclude that uh, with, the, with the potential exploration of ICB data, we can, there is a chance of identifying the hidden bottlenecks in freeway or any arterials. Thank you. Right. Thank you Sven, for the presentation. Uh, great presentation. So does, uh, does anyone have any question on these? Uh, um, I have some questions. So, regarding the algorithm that you used uh, to uh, to match the points uh, on the onto the road network, uh, did you consider also using, for example, some freely available apps, uh, for example, like OpenStreetMap? Because I believe that uh, there are some uh, APIs on OpenStreetMap where if you send a GPS point, they can uh, match it to the closest uh, roadway in their database or something. Uh, I th um, or did you have to manually do it? Uh, I think manually uh, with the code manually, okay. but at the end to visualize, we use QGIS. Just QGIS, yeah, 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 yeah. But it's just that if you have to scale it up, there are some uh, APIs that you can use on some uh, open uh, maps, like open street maps, where you have uh, the possibility to set a GPS point and ask what is the closest building landmark or street or etc. to this, and then you can use that. But I'm not sure how slow it is, though. Uh, for very large data set, it may be slow to process. Yeah. I'm not sure. You have to do. Yeah. And another question, very briefly. So what do you think is the main advantage of this ICV data versus the sensor data that we get usually on the highways? What? Uh, uh, I th okay. So sensor data are there specific to a location. They have a set specific location. But this ICV data is it's like a vehicle act as a pro vehicle, the pro vehicle, so it can go anywhere. So uh, so we will have a larger spread. Like we, we can, we don't have to deploy or put uh, put uh, devices everywhere in every intersection. A uh, same vehicle can go can be anywhere in, the, in in throughout the United States and can collect the data for us. I think that's the major advantage. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Zodik, for the for the presentation. So uh, I think in the interest of time, we're going to move to the next presentation. Thank you. So much. thanks again. Zodik. So for the next presentation, uh, the next presenter is Aaron Burns, and uh, he's going to present uh, his work on a smart car space optimization to reduce double parking congestion and energy consumption. I guess it's related to EVs. So the floor is yours, Aaron. You can go ahead.
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Aaron Burns. I'm a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, my advisors are Costa Samaras and Jeremy Mihalik. And um, this uh, research is funded by the Department of Energy um, and we're investigating a technology concept called smart curb space and the ability for this technology to reduce double parking congestion and energy uh, consumption. Okay, so the scenario that we're interested in is where we uh, study delivery vehicles that are arriving uh, to make deliveries, but the community of delivery vehicles often operate in an uncoordinated manner and they arrive at parking spaces in this first come first serve um, competition. And when uh, multiple delivery vehicles arrive in a similar time frame, it's often that a parking space will not be available for one or many of the delivery vehicles. And so uh, the delivery vehicle will double park uh, is one behavior that we study in this research, but they may also uh, cruise to another parking location or reroute to another uh, delivery that they have to make. Uh, we focus on double parking. The issue with double parking is that it can cause just issues for the surrounding environment. The one that we're going to focus on is the congestion that's caused uh, to the surrounding vehicle traffic. And when vehicles uh, are, this additional congestion is building, it creates vehicle queues, it delays surrounding traffic and causes fuel loss, unnecessary fuel loss, uh, which is how we ultimately estimate energy consumption. So I'm going to walk you through this process in our research and um, the question that we're really trying to investigate is, if we could more optimally schedule how delivery vehicles arrive to their delivery locations, could we reduce uh, the frequency of double parking, which would then have an impact on uh, fuel consumption at the end of the day? It'd just be a little more, uh, a little smarter about how we use our parking spaces. Okay, so the technology that we're investigating is called a smart curb space system. And there's a graphic on the slide that depicts um, the, the general idea. Um, essentially, I, I often tell people it's like Airbnb for parking spaces. Um, essentially, there's a reservable set of parking spaces set aside for delivery vehicles, and they could request to park at some time uh, ahead of time. And so they'd have uh, a space waiting for them when they need to make a delivery. On the left side of this graphic is the first come, first serve scenario I first mentioned, where uh, if you can see the green semi truck is parked, but it's blocking a lane of traffic and causing congestion issues. But if you could tell that green truck to arrive slightly rate later, like uh, 310, perhaps you could sequence so that the green truck arrived as the blue truck was departing. Um, and so you don't have an instance of double parking and don't have the associated congestion um, and externalities to the surrounding traffic. So in order to model uh, this smart curb space system, we implement uh, two different versions of an optimization structure from the parking slot assignment problem. Uh, we have a mixed integer linear program and an integer linear program that, that we implement, uh, the details of which are in backup slides if, if someone's interested in discussing further. Um, but essentially what, what we're doing is depicted in this graphic here, and I'll, I'll show you some details from this graphic. Um, I first want to show you the first come first serve scenario. So non-optimized, uncoordinated set of delivery vehicles are arriving. Um, in this graphic, there are only two delivery vehicle parking spaces available. Uh, indicated by these horizontal rows. And so across time, each of these black delivery trucks are arriving and they're able to park. And they park for a certain duration here that's the length of their rectangle. Unfortunately, when you're operating in an uncoordinated fashion, there are also other delivery vehicles that arrive, but if parking occupancy is already full, then for example, these three delivery vehicles have to double park, or we assume that they double park, there's no parking available for them. If you can, however, optimize uh, the arrival schedule, perhaps you could tell one delivery vehicle to arrive slightly earlier and one slightly later, and then you can start to accommodate some of these delivery vehicles that in an uncoordinated fashion uh, just didn't have anywhere to park. Um, and in this example, we can accommodate three of the four double park trucks. And so what you're going to see in this research is the general theme is let's look at what a first come first serve scenario would provide us in terms of uh, uh, the different metrics that we'll look at, and we'll compare it and see how much we can reduce uh, maybe the total minutes of double parking with the optimal parking schedule. And I'll, I will show you some metrics here in just a slide or two. There's one additional uh, set of steps that we use to help us ultimately estimate the impact of congestion and ultimately fuel consumption. And we walk through a series of uh, steps in our workflow. Basically, I take, uh, I figure out how many trucks have double parked I can convert that into the total minutes of lane obstruction that would be observed um, in that city street throughout the day, um, assuming that you may have multiple trucks that are double parked at the same time, but maybe they're just uh, only obstructing uh, a lane for a small period of time, uh, kind of like a, a net double parking or total lane obstruction metric uh, is what we call it. 
And then once I know the moments of lane obstruction, I can lay this into um, a simplistic queuing model. And essentially I, I set up the modeling so that uh, a queue will build and uh, develop anytime there's lane obstruction. And if you have a queue that's forming, then you also have associated vehicle delay and fuel consumption. And this is just an example graphic here to show you that there, there are basically two lines here. Um, there's an arrival rate and a set of vehicles that are arriving over time by this blue dashed line. And then there's also, also a departure rate of vehicles that are able to pass by the smart curve space system. And when they're blocked by lane obstruction, you fewer vehicles can, de can depart. So you have this queue, this region in between, that's a queue that's forming. And that ultimately helps us uh, estimate how many vehicles are in the queue and for how long. Okay, so I wanna take you through a few of our metrics here just to give you a sense for, for what we're trying to get after. Uh, this first metric here is just simply how much can we reduce double parking between the first come first serve scenario and our optimized parking schedule. Uh, with, within each of these scenarios, we have one key parameter that we can tune and that's uh, called schedule flexibility. So um, on the left graphic, we have zero schedule flexibility. And that essentially means that a delivery vehicle wanted to park at 10 a.m. And we have zero flexibility to move them to 10.05 or 9.55. We just, we have zero minutes, so we cannot move them. Graphic on the right, we have five minutes of flexibility. So now I could actually tell that vehicle that arrived, wanted to arrive at 10 o'clock, hey, arrive at 10.05, we're gonna accommodate someone before you, or we're gonna shift your schedule just ever so slightly. We thought that five minutes was a good uh, starting uh, value for that parameter, just, um, just as a first, glance at maybe something that might be realistic that we could ask a delivery vehicle to slightly shift their arrival time. Um, just to orient you to uh, some of the different variables that we're, we're studying. So let me talk about the graphics now, um, now more specifically. So on the left, I mentioned there was zero flexibility. However, we are applying an optimal schedule and comparing it to a first come first serve schedule. And so what you can see is that there are some opportunities to reduce double parking but not very many. The y-axis here is maybe between one to two minutes of double parking per hour per parking space, uh, normalized metrics. So you would wanna expand that by uh, how many hours of the day that you'd consider uh, maybe 10 hours per day of delivery vehicle uh, time. On the right, when we're able to increase the amount of flexibility with those de uh, delivery vehicle drivers and really shift when they can arrive, we can now have a larger impact um, between maybe three to seven minutes uh, reduction in double parking minutes uh, per hour per parking space. So something more substantial, more tangible. Another way to look at the smart curb space system is to compare uh, two options. If you had traditional parking spaces, uh, how many minutes uh, of double parking could you reduce by converting to a smart optimized system compared with adding one traditional parking space? And so I take a plot on this chart the comparison between those two reductions in double parking minutes. Um, and any data points that you see that are above the red dash line would indicate that converting to that smart curb space system is a better solution in terms of reducing double parking than adding one more parking space. Uh, so from this graphic, you know, probably the takeaway is that smart curb space isn't a dominant solution, um, but does increase in effectiveness as you increase the amount of flexibility that you have with the delivery vehicle drivers if you can shift their schedules. Um, and tends to increase, though maybe in a diminishing manner, uh, as your smart curb space system increases in the number of parking spaces. And just for your reference, uh, five minutes of flexibility is kind of the, the case of interest that we're, we often look at here, sort of in this region. Okay, I want to take you to the end of our workflow here and talk about changes in vehicle delay and fuel consumption. Uh, so after you understand how much double parking you have um, in your optimal scenario, you then can run it through the queuing model I mentioned previously. Uh, and when, when you do that, um, you can output metrics on vehicle delay. And if you assume that you have so many minutes of vehicle delay, you can also scale that by an idling coefficient to estimate how many of gallons of fuel would be consumed during that total delay. And the takeaway from this graph is that you have between 15 and maybe 45 minutes of vehicle delay per hour per parking space that you can reduce um, by applying a smart curb space system. And that also uh, is equivalently will uh, equate to between 0.1 and 0.2 gallons of fuel per hour per parking space. So remember that the hours, uh, the units here are per hour per parking space. If you assume that maybe you have the 10 hours per day, 365 days a year, you could be saving somewhere in the order of 300 to 700 gallons of fuel per parking space on an annual basis. 
And that is similar to about $20,000 to $50,000 in congestion externalities as well as, as one of the takeaways from our study. One thing though to consider as a key takeaway from our paper is that the results I've just presented you are an ideal stick scenario, probably an upper bound. And that if I'm able to optimally tell vehicles when to arrive, my results assume that the vehicle will arrive precisely when I ask them to. But uh, in a realistic scenario, there's going to be uncertainty in when that delivery vehicle will arrive, regardless of if they uh, had flexibility built into their schedule. They may arrive one minute early or two minutes late. We're not entirely sure. So in order to accommodate that, we have this concept called a buffer, uh, where we want to say that between reservations, you need to have uh, in the examples presented here, five minutes between. So a truck arrives two minutes late, yet they could still be accommodated. We left space in the schedule where they could still be able to park. The problem is when you add this buffer, you're inherently taking out time at which you could schedule other delivery vehicles, or you may lose an hour of time across the day when you could have scheduled delivery vehicles. So compared to the graphic that you've already seen, this is the reduction in double parking. That changes pretty significantly once you add a buffer and take the time out. And um, we think that this is probably a lower bound. So you're kind of looking at the upper bound and then the lower bound on these results. The future, the next step of work that we're hoping to do is reassess our schedule after we have added the buffer. And hopefully we can bring up some of these results. Um, uh, what's interesting also in this chart is you see some negative reductions in double parking, which would indicate that the first come first serve scenario was outperforming the optimal. But again, this is inherently due to the time that you lose by adding a buffer between the reservations. Okay, so let me just spend a moment or two on this last slide here, summarizing some of the implications from uh, the research and uh, the insights for stakeholders. Um, I, I again reiterate with this uh, top bullet here, some of the potential savings in an ideal case that you could find from a single smart curb space, and that's uh, savings here, monetary savings in terms of just the travel and congestion delay that you are able to reduce by adding a smart curb space system, and also the gallons of fuel. And ultimately, this is our, how we interpret the amount of energy you could save from a smart curb space parking space. However, like I just mentioned on the previous slide, probably this is these numbers are probably an upper bound. You add a buffer is probably the lower bound, and hopefully the actual performance is somewhere in between. Within our modeling, there are also some uh, things that a, a city stakeholder should consider about their local conditions. And that's really um, based on how much flexibility delivery vehicle drivers would be willing to accept. Maybe it's not five minutes, maybe it's zero minutes or 10 minutes. That's local, dependent on local conditions. Uh, if it's a very congested area or there's high deliveries uh, demand for a certain uh, strip of um, city block, that will also have an impact on some of your energy consumption uh, and some of the reduction in double parking metrics I've discussed. And one other quick note is I limit the maximum queue length uh, based on like one city block, uh, any changes to the maximum queue length can actually drastically impact some of the energy consumption network metrics. And then I, I will note here, there are a few things that city stakeholders should also consider. We use one type of objective function that focuses on the total minutes of double parking, which really favors delivery vehicle drivers. But you could also focus on maybe minimizing lane obstruction or maximizing revenue from parking spaces. There's just different ways to look at the problem. The last bullet here talks to the importance of enforcement of this technology. If you can't enforce the reservations, you'll lose buy-in from your customers. Uh, and then the system really isn't very effective. Uh, and also the importance of incorporating additional users such as Uber and Lyft, which is part of the next step in our research. So I think I'll conclude this presentation here uh, and just highlight again that we studied a new technology concept which tries to optimize parking for delivery vehicles by optimizing schedules. We feel confident about some of our estimates on the upper bound of performance, but think that there's additional research um, to find a more realistic number, noting that we've probably found the lower bound uh, by adding a buffer into um, the optimal scheduling. And so thank you for your time. Uh, I'll stop here, open up for questions, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Aaron, for the presentation. So um, does anyone have any question to ask Aaron? Uh, on the subject, so uh, I have uh, I have one uh, question. Or I'm not sure. Kara, do you want to ask any question? Yeah. Uh, he can answer so, my question later. It's a little off topic, so you should sorry, ask sorry. yours. 
<laughs> All right. Yeah. So, Aaron, just uh, I have, a, I mean, not a question, more, more a comment. Uh, my uh, former PhD student, uh, Michele Simoni, solved a problem that was related, but uh, not as complex as yours for the scheduling of the of the parking space. However, uh, he had uh, more focused on the traffic flow model for the consequences of double parking and the externalities of that. So, I guess uh, it would be nice if you could connect with him. Uh, his name is Michele Simoni. He's with uh, KTH uh, in uh, Sweden. Okay. Uh, earlier. So yeah. Um, so yeah, Kara just mentioned this. Yeah, uh, and uh, and yeah, it's it's very interesting work that you did. Uh, I think uh, it also shows that uh, the the as usual in transportation, the the gains that we can have by optimizing are always very very limited. But uh, you know, it's the depressing fact uh, that between the the social optimum and uh, and uh, the global optimum. I mean, it's, it's always a few percent that you can gain at most, but it's always important to gain these persons because it's still uh, money lost uh, some, somehow or efficiency lost. Yeah. Thank you. And apply it across, that's a single parking space applied across one city or 10 cities. You could. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That makes a lot of benefits. Yeah. 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 Very good. Perfect. So very good. So if no other question, just uh, in the in the interest of time, let's move on to our last speaker. So our last speaker is uh, Kinhua Jiang who will present uh, his work on developing highway capacity manual, capacity adjustment factors for connected and automated traffic and two-way stop control intersections. Uh, um, so Hi, everyone. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yeah, we can see your screen. Thanks. OK. Uh, given we only have the presentation within 10 minutes. Yeah, sure. OK. So, uh, hi everyone, my name is Qinghua Jiang, I'm a PhD candidate from UCLA, and today I'm going to discuss about the developing highway capacity manual capacity adjustment factors for connected automated traffic at two-way stop controlled intersections. So, just a little bit of background information for the topic. I believe a lot of you have been very familiar with the connected automated vehicle, or CAV. It's basically the integration of the automated vehicle tech technologies uh, it's been developed rapidly over the decades and also as transportation researchers uh, i believe we're very familiar with highway capacity menu it contains concept guidelines and computational procedure for computing the capacity and quality of service of various highway facilities including uh, the two-way stop controlled intersection that we're going to talk about today so uh, what is two-way stop control intersection? It's uh, a very common uh, type of intersection in the United States. Uh, for a typical two-way stop control intersection, basically uh, it's a four-leg intersection, and there's a main street and then the minor, uh, minor street, and the movement of the traffic is controlled by the stop sign instead of the traffic signal. And uh, HCM developed a empirical equation to calculate the capacity of each of the movements involved in the intersection. And in, in this equation, the capacity is a function of conflicting flow, the critical headway, and the follow-up headway. And as we can see in this curve, uh, this graph, it's the capacity curve against the conflicting flow. And the critical headway is the, the smallest gap that the driver is willing to accept. Uh, when merging into the main, uh, main, main street, major streets, it determines the gap acceptance behavior of the vehicles on the minor road. While the follow-up headway is the time between the departure of the first vehicle from the intersection entry and the departure of the next vehicle using the same major streets headway. And uh, so this model is being widely used uh, but the biggest limitation is that the model is developed based on a conventional a vehicle traffic environment. So um, it, it will be interesting to see uh, how the capacity will change uh, when a certain share of CAVs were introduced to the traffic. And also, will this equation still be valid to estimate the mixed traffic uh, capacity? So the very first step of the study is we uh, build up the base model. And uh, this is the very typical to stop control intersection and uh, we conduct the simulation on the microscopic simulation platform VSIM and uh, there are four movements we uh, want to focus on. Uh, these are uh, the major straight uh, left turn movement, 
which is the westbound left, and the uh, minor straights uh, through movement, left movement, and right turn movement, or uh, denoted as the NBT, NBR, and NBR. And to start, before we start the simulation, we uh, kind of recalibrated the gap acceptance behavior in VISM to make sure that the uh, capacity curve under the uh, base case scenario is uh, well fitted with the capacity results calculated by the HCM model. And this will determine uh, the gap acceptance behavior, not only for the conventional vehicles, but also for the uh, CAVs in further scenarios. And for uh, we, we're doing this by uh, adjusting the uh, gap acceptance control parameters in BASEM. And one of the big advantages for the CAVs in, in terms of the driving behavior uh, is the car following behavior. And here we adopted the CACC uh, car following model developed by the California PASS program. Uh, and we use it as the car model for the CAVs in the traffic. And uh, on top of the uh, car following model, we also develop enhanced gap acceptance behavior for all the vehicles, all the CAVs approaching from the minor streets. And this basically allows the CAV to build up the, the V2V connection with the CAV coming from the major streets. So this enabled the CAV to start the gap acceptance judgment before it even arrive at the entrance of the intersection. So uh, regarding the scenarios, we uh, we set up different uh, uh, CAV market penetration rates uh, ranging from zero to uh, 100 at 20% uh, increment so that we can uh, investigate the impact of the uh, CAVs on the uh, into uh, the uh, different movement capacity. And the simulation runtime is uh, 7,500 seconds, including five minutes of warm-up time. And regarding the data we're going to collect, uh, first of all, it's the capacity data. We basically counted the, uh, the traffic flow data, the hourly flow as the capacity for each other movements. And on top of that, we also collected the critical headway and follow-up headway for each of the movements so that we can uh, calculate the analytical capacity result using the HCM method and compare it with the traffic simulation results. And here are uh, some of the results from the simulation. So these two graphs shows the capacity change while the CAV market penetration uh, increases under different uh, um, conflicting flow rate condition and for a different movement involved in the intersection. And basically, we can see that uh, when the conflict flow rate is zero, the capacity curve flow, uh, the, uh, the capacity flow follows a quadratic trend and the increase of west, westbound left is less obvious because this is the major straight left turn. And since it, it already has a, a relatively larger capacity than the minor road and movement, so the increase, uh, the, so the uh, uh, the uh, advantage of the CAV coupling behavior is not that obvious or that significant. But uh, when we take a look at a relatively higher conflicting flow rate condition, we can see that uh, for all the movements, the increments in capacity when the CAV market penetration increases is not so significant except the uh, the major uh, major street left turn and the my, uh, minor street right turn and I think the this indicates that uh, as the conflicting flow rate gets higher uh, the CAVs from the uh, from the uh, entry lanes, uh, it, it becomes harder for them to keep the CCC cut following behavior when they're trying to merge into the intersection. And also we uh, we measured the follow-up headway and critical headway um, for each of the movements to see if there are uh, any changes as the CV market penetration increases. We can find that uh, for the critical headway, 
the, the change is very slight uh, when the CAV uh, market share increases, uh, except for the minor straight uh, through movements has some slight increase. Uh, on the other hand, when we take a look at the follow-up headway, um, for each of the movement, the follow-up headway has a very a pronounced increase when the CAV market share increases. And this basically indicates that uh, the uh, cut following behavior of the CAV helps to uh, increase the, uh, the gap utilization efficiency for all the uh, CAV in the uh, entering lane so that they can better use the, uh, the gap created by the conflicting uh, traffic flow. And also, uh, uh, we can uh, conclude that uh, the critical headway, uh, sorry, um, they say a CAV, uh, behavior, a CAV coupling behavior will not significantly change the gap acceptance judgment for all the CAVs. And at last, we compared the results between um, the HCM model calculated capacity with the simulation uh, capacity under two different CAV market penetration condition. Uh, so we can find that uh, when the CAV market penetration is zero, the two model has a very good fit. Uh, well, when we uh, take a look at the, the full CAV scenario, the HCM calculated capacity uh, is not well fitted with the uh, VSM measured cap uh, capacity. This basically indicates that when the CAV market penetration increases, the current uh, HCM empirical capacity calculation model is not quite appropriate to calculate, uh, to precisely calculate the uh, capacity. Uh, so based on uh, the, uh, well, well, so after we compare the capacity value uh, calculated on the different uh, CAV market penetration scenarios, and we compare it with the base case capacity values. We uh, developed this uh, capacity uh, adjustment factors table for uh, different movements on their different CAV market penetration uh, scenario. So this basically allows us to uh, get an estimation of the capacity uh, when we have a determined CAV market penetration and uh, uh, we know the conflicting flow rate for the specific uh, movements in the intersection. And to conclude, um, so first of all, uh, from the simulation results, we, we know that uh, when the CAV market penetration rate increases, the capacity of all the uh, analysis movements increase to different uh, extent. The effect is more significant when the conflicting flow rate is lower. And for all the movements, the, um, the CAV, uh, the advanced CAV behaviors basically provides the considerable decrease in the follow-up headway. Um, uh, while the critical headway, it keeps re relatively stable. So, uh, and the improvement of the westbound left or the major strip left turn is lower than the movement of the other uh, movements. And the capacity results calculated by the HCM model can fit well with the um, actually uh, counted uh, capacity values when the CAV market penetration rate is at zero. But as we increase the CAV uh, market share, the, uh, the HCM model cannot do a very good estimation on the uh, actual uh, capacity values. And that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Kenwa, for the great presentation. Uh, so does anyone have any question to Kenwa? We may need to turn it over right now. So we have our okay. transportation safety session starting with Oscar Ovedo as the moderator and Kenwa remains the uh, tech room staff. So he'll be here and can answer questions in the chat box. Um, Oscar and Kinwa, maybe you guys can check to see that all uh, six presenters are here. I, I saw Ken is here, Ron is here. I think Norris is here. He's got two papers. It looks like he's presenting. And then you have Hannah and Mickey. And I just, um, I assume they're here. 
I am here. Okay, uh, <laughs> I will make uh, the moderator of the uh, of the next track the co-host and right. uh, for for the audience, if you have any questions regarding my presentation, feel free to uh, send in the chat box or email me directly. Okay, thank you. Oscar. So Harold, it looks like you you go by Mickey. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'm actually Harold the third, and my family is of Irish heritage, and uh, Mickey is a term of endearment passed down 